Good morning to everyone. Well, well, good morning again. <laughs> and a special warm welcome to Professor Loschel. It's an honor to have you here, Andreas. I am sincerely grateful for you accepting to be with us today. Andreas, you are very kind for joining us. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for coming to our eighth symposium. The focus of this year's symposium is energy efficiency, economics, and policy. As uh, we say in our booklet, climate change is without doubt one of the main threats faced by present and future generations when trying to achieve sustainable development because of its negative effects on the economy, health, and social welfare. The new social model needs to compel emissions reduction and achieve sustainable economic growth. Within this context, energy efficiency can be seen as one of the main tools for reaching this target. Although, and although energy efficiency has always been an important component in, Europe, in European policy, in recent years it has received a significant boost with the setting of quantitative targets to increase energy efficiency, making it a priority in Europe's energy strategy with the Energy Efficiency Directive and the Energy performance of buildings directive. Specifically, European members are planning how to achieve at least 32.5% improvement in energy efficiency by 2030. Energy efficiency will play a central role in decarbonizing industrial processes, but much of the reduced energy demand will occur in buildings in both the residential and service sectors, thanks to a robust innovation framework and the digitalization process. However, according to the recent publica publication of the European Environment Agency, Trends and Projections in Europe 2019, the trends in energy consumption observed by recent years put the European Union at risk of missing its energy efficiency target. In this sense, achieving an ambitious energy efficiency objectives requires the member states adopt new policies and implement additional measures to remove barriers in order to facilitate investment in energy efficiency. This leads us to ask, for instance, what role does energy efficiency play in Europe's policy to tackle climate change? Why are firms and consumers investing enough in energy efficiency? Or which measures might favor energy efficiency practices? Today, our eighth symposium will try to debate and answer some of the questions about the role played by energy efficiency now and in the future for the energy sector, its implications and challenges from a new energy policy approach. These questions will be analyzed by contributors. The strict selection of papers presents us innovative ideas on these topics. The debate will be addressed by our illustrious chairs who will guide the discussion. Thank you very much for joining us again. The first table is focused on energy efficiency and consumption. The significant topic will be approached by Pablo del Rio from the Spanish National Research Council, Elisa Trujillo Baute from the University of Barcelona and the chair of Energy Sustainability and IEB, Mathieu Glachon from Mindstech and CERNA, and lastly by Pier Paolo Parrota from IECEG School of Management. 
Monica Giulietti, professor of Lobru University, chairs this table. Global energy efficiency trends is a topic of the second table. The papers will analyze models of consumption and the objective of energy efficiency for the transition to a low carbon economy. <coughs> Professor Christopher Baringer from the University of Aldeburgh, Marina Economidou from the Joint Research Center, and Louise Gaetan Giraudet from L'Ecole de Pont, Paris Tech, and Ciret will present the, uh, and debate these papers. The table is chaired by Andreas Loscher, professor at Munster University. And the third table deals with an analysis of the type of energy policy required to achieve greater energy efficiency. Analyzing energy policies is chaired by Tora Hamas from the Copenhagen School of Energy Infrastructure. Donatella Bayardi from the University of Parma Jose Garcia Quevedo from the University of Barcelona, Chair of Energy Sustainability and IEB, and Helen Schweiger from the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development will tackle these issues. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude to keynote speakers, Professor Andreas Loschel and Ulrich Wagner, who will be in charge of the closing session. It's a great pleasure for me to present a giant in energy and environment economics, Professor Andreas Rocha. He holds the chair for energy and resource economics at the University of Munster, Munster as is director of the Center of Applied Economic Research Munster since 2014. Since 2011, uh, he has chaired of Energy Expert Commission of the German government to monitor energy transformation. And since 2017, he directs the virtual institute in Smart Energy North Rhine-Westphalia. He is a lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for the fifth and sixth assessment report. He is also a member of the National Academy of Science and Technology, a member of the Council of the IW of Berlin, <laughs> visiting chair professor at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing, and from 2019, uh, an associate researcher of the chair of sustainability and IEB of uh, Barcelona University. He was visiting professor at I, uh, MIT, Stanford University, Australian National University, Tsinghua University of Beijing, and Oxford University, to name a few. His research interests are in applied microeconomics, energy economics, and the economics of climate change. Andreas Loscher advised the European Commission, the European Parliament, the OECD, the World Bank, and national ministers in, ministers in Germany, Switzerland, and the UK on environmental, energy, and climate change issues. He has published more than 158 papers and articles in the top journals as Energy Economic, Ecological Economics, European Economic Review, Journal of Public Economics, and many others. And he has contributed to 18 books. He is on the editorial boards of Climate Policy, the Energy Journal, and Economic e Journal. With uh, his contribution, Professor Leschow has more than 5,000 citations and has become a reference in the area of energy economics and environmental economics, being among the top 5% of authors in the world, in the number of works, distinct works, citations, H index, and asterisk views. The Handelsblatt ranking of German economists, 
lists him among the top 100 in 2017. In the ranking of economies of the Frankfurter Allemagne Zeitun, he was several times among the 50 most influential economies in Germany. As can be noted in my previous words, Professor Loscher has an extensive and prestigious CV and is, of course, of the most, one of the most distinguished researchers in the field worldwide. Andreas, it's an honor and a pleasure to welcome you as a keynote speaker in this symposium. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Maite, for, for this very nice welcome. I think you know my CV better than I do, um, so, <laughs> so excellent. Um, when I was asked uh, to uh, talk uh, today here um, uh, in the symposium, um, I was um, uh, thinking about the general theme now of this symposium, which is energy efficiency. Um, and uh, if you ask uh, economists about energy efficiency, they will usually come up with a simple answer, which is uh, increase energy prices um, to foster energy efficiency. Um, so therefore, uh, I would like to uh, talk about uh, the recent activities of the German government uh, to implement carbon prices, especially in the sectors outside the ETS. Um, but uh, we as well know from the uh, German example that um, uh, just, um, um, uh, that just uh, looking uh, at uh, increased efficiency or promoting renewables is not enough uh, to reduce emissions, um, but it's as well really about uh, how to drive out uh, fossil energy out of the energy system. So the second uh, theme I want to report on um, is the coal phase out, which is another uh, major energy, uh, energy related initiative uh, in Germany um, uh, that was recently enacted. I think both, both of these topics um, are relevant as well on the European scale uh, because uh, we will see that, uh, and I will argue that uh, the carbon pricing initiative of the German government uh, will, will play an important role as well in the future of the Green New Deal uh, being uh, relevant as well for many other uh, economies potentially in Europe, uh, thinking about the extent of the European emissions trading system and um, I hope that the, the example of the coal phase out as well uh, uh, shows uh, some of the implementation challenges you know, uh, other governments are facing with high shares of coal when getting serious about reducing coal and it reiterates a bit uh, the economic advice on how to um, uh, move towards a more sustainable energy system which is rely more on economic instruments and less on um, uh, governmentally uh, regulated Related uh, direct interventions. So this is the lessons uh, learned from these two experiences. Uh, when um, uh, Joe Kaser, um, the CEO of the German industrial giant Siemens, um, was asked in 2015 about some insights about energy policies, uh, he said um, at a conference, anyone that has to take over responsibility for energy policy in a country has it quite easy. Uh, just do the opposite of what Germany is doing. Um, so if you uh, follow the advice of Cho Kese, no, um, uh, you will uh, probably uh, consider um, again these uh, two policy examples I'm, I'm going to show you. Uh, on the other hand, I would like to convince you that uh, at least the direction is a good direction uh, to take, even though implementation is probably uh, difficult. Um, I'm, I'm, I want to uh, as well direct you, uh, might have mentioned already that um, I'm chairing the energy uh, expert committee of the German government, we are publishing a yearly report uh, on the energy transition in Germany. Um, so you no, it's, it's me, it's here. Um, where do I have to point this to? Okay, okay. Uh, it's on? Yes. Okay. Okay, so... Um, so here uh, you can find more information if you're interested um, in this. Uh, we are publishing this report annually. We as well, um, we are doing a, a more detailed assessment also on energy efficiency improvements in Germany. Um, you can see here um, a, a very simple traffic light system where basically all traffic lights that are related to energy efficiency policies in Germany are red. 
uh, because we are basically missing all our energy efficiency targets. Um, that's true for uh, uh, primary energy, but as, that's as well true uh, for energy efficiency in the different sectors. Um, I'm as well charged with uh, monitoring the national action plan on energy efficiency for the German government. And I can assure you we have a large list of measures actually on energy efficiency. Uh, we have around 50 measures now uh, of the German government. Um, and if you monitor them, you can find uh, that uh, only a handful of these measures are really effective. Uh, and they usually contribute very little to carbon mitigation. Um, so most of these measures are really small-scale measures, no? uh, with, of course, a lot of additional cost in implementing these measures and as well uh, um, finding the, um, the uh, really um, uh, effectiveness of these measures. Um, so therefore, um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about carbon pricing, no? which provides a more systematic uh, approach to um, uh, reduce using energy use and uh, increasing efficiency. Okay, so um, why are we doing this? Well, because we want to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and you can see here uh, that uh, Germany uh, has already gone quite a long way. This is, these are emissions uh, from uh, 1850 uh, to today. Um, and you see the peak uh, of emissions in Germany was, and this is true for many countries, was around 1980. Now, and then, since then, emissions have gone down uh, pretty uh, steeply. Um, nowadays, um, uh, Germany uh, has reduced its emission uh, by more than 35% compared to 1990. They want to uh, achieve 40% and 55% in uh, 2030. That's all um, uh, status quo. Uh, it's not uh, taking into account the Green New Deal, um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about this later on, because the Green New Deal is, of course, going to affect as well member state uh, policies in the emissions trading sector, but as well in the other sectors. So um, uh, based on these um, uh, assessments, assessment. The, the German government has set up a climate action plan for the different sectors, uh, um, uh, putting up sectoral targets uh, for uh, the energy sector, uh, for the building sector, for the transport sector, and other sectors. Uh, industry, of course, uh, but as well agriculture and so forth. Um, we know that the costs of, these, of reducing uh, carbon in these different sectors uh, are uh, uh, heterogeneous, uh, so uh, actually the easiest part is the energy part, and then comes probably building, transport, industry, agriculture, like I showed it on this slide. Um, so it makes uh, a lot of sense uh, to think about decarbonizing energy first. And um, here in the in the slide, you can see that the German government has tried to differentiate a bit the targets of the um, uh, energy transition, but not sufficiently from my point of view. Um, um, so there are still uh, uh, large hopes uh, on reducing emissions in industry. There are large hopes in reducing emissions uh, in the transport sector, uh, which might be much more difficult than anticipated. No? So um, this will be a difficult, a difficult uh, chart. Uh, and you can as well see that from now on, uh, it requires reducing emissions in many of these big sectors by more than 4% per year. So this is really substantial. No? Uh, in um, uh, it's, it's really unclear whether we achieve the continuation you know, of these emission reductions in the different sectors. In the past, um, we have uh, uh, decarbonized uh, much less. It would, in fact, mean that we have to triple our uh, reduction uh, uh, efforts uh, in the next decade to come. So totally unclear how this uh, can happen. Um, and um, this is the background for the uh, German government to, uh, to uh, initiate um, uh, two big programs. The first is the coal phase-out, uh, because uh, coal is obviously the biggest contribution in the energy sector in Germany, with a very uh, coal based electricity generation system in Germany, where coal makes up more than one-third of electricity generated and a large fraction of the emission. And the second one is uh, carbon pricing in the non-ETS sectors, that is part of industry, but especially transportation and building. Um, so these are the two big initiatives that have been enacted in the last year. And as I said, uh, will, will um, I think, dominate the discussion about the energy transition uh, in the uh, time to come. 
uh, if you th think about cold phase out, and I know that's as well a big uh, topic, of course, in Spain, um, uh, we already had a very substantial coal phase out in Germany, uh, which is the phase out of hard coal mining. Uh, German hard coal mining um, was uh, not competitive uh, in the last um, 40 years or so, uh, and we've seen uh, a full phase out of hard coal mining in Germany um, uh, up to or until uh, last year, um, and in actually in 2019, the last uh, coal mine in Germany was closed. Um, uh, the, um, oh, I always have to push this one. Um, so if you look at the number of mines that we have and the number of employees we had in Germany, this is really, this was really the big challenge. You know, in Germany in the 1960s, uh, we had uh, around um, uh, 400, 500,000 people working in the mining sector. And these numbers are re were reduced to zero in 2019. So over uh, uh, 50 years uh, time, um, we reduced actually um, uh, the, the number uh, of miners um, from half a million and more uh, to zero. And you can uh, um, imagine how uh, big you know, the pressure and, and the adjustment actually was. And this uh, coal phase out was done uh, following the social market model you know, of Germany, what we call the Rhinian capitalism, uh, where we try to find solutions uh, in cooperation uh, between firms, companies, and the government you know, to solve these issues. Um, trade unions uh, supported the hard coal mining uh, phase out. And uh, um, they, there was even a, an own entity, the uh, Rack Foundation, uh, founded um, in order to ensure the transition um, of uh, the German coal sector. Um, in Germany, um, and the structural uh, transition was uh, really the, the core issue of the coal phase out. You know? um, the, uh, mainly, of course, in North Rhine-Westphalia, the place where I'm now teaching, you know, uh, where a lot of the coal mining uh, facility was there. And um, this is not a trivial task, um, because we know that a lot of these regional economic developments are path dependent, so it's, it's, it's really difficult to change, and they are very place dependent. So it really depends on the specific um, uh, frameworks you know, uh, of the regions that you are talking about. In the case of uh, North Rhine is failure. Uh, for example, they did a lot on uh, spurring inward investments, um, uh, uh, increasing attraction, um, uh, working on sectoral diversification um, with, for example, the tourism sector and other sectors really playing a role. Uh, they invest a lot on spin offs and startups. I mean, you talked about the Virtual Institute Smart Energy that is a part of this uh, activities. Uh, so, trying um, uh, to bring in a new and innovative businesses uh, often related to energy uh, to these areas. Um, so this, um, um, these um, relatively positive um, uh, experience uh, of the uh, coal phase out has to be kept in mind uh, when we talk about the second phase out of coal, uh, which is the, co the phase out of coal electricity generation. Um, that is uh, much smaller uh, in terms of ambition levels because in the German um, uh, generation sector, uh, coal generation uh, and mining, um, that's open pit mining um, of uh, lignite, there are about 20,000 uh, people uh, employed. So it's a much smaller sector directly employed, another 20,000 indirectly employed. Um, so, um, so that is obviously um, uh, less ambitious, uh, but um, the idea of uh, phasing out coal generation follows the same pattern as the first coal phase out. Uh, so the German government uh, set up a commission uh, in 2018 that was called uh, Commission for Growth, Structural Change and Regional Development. Okay? And uh, you might miss the mentioning of coal because the, um, the aim of the commission was uh, to uh, think about uh, measures uh, to ensure that the climate target in 2030 is reached and that, uh, the, that coal is ultimately ended uh, in the first half of the 21st century. Um, but from the name, you see that, again, the focus of the commission was on issues of structural change, 
growth and employment, which played a, a, a big role. And actually, a lot of the uh, measures that were enacted by um, the government as a, a follow-up uh, of the uh, recommendations of the Commission were on structural change issues. Um, in fact, um, around um, 40, 40 billion euro on structural support uh, will be directed um, to uh, the, uh, the coal areas in Germany, uh, which is uh, especially in the eastern Germany, uh, Lusatia and Saxony-Anhalt, um, uh, and in the western part of Germany, uh, the uh, Rhenish mining district. Uh, so a lot of money uh, uh, given to these um, regions uh, in order to cope with the foreseen structural change, because the employment, of course, is is uh, concentrated uh, in these areas, and especially the east of Germany, is a relatively um, uh, structurally a weak region in Germany, you know, so uh, government was very serious about that. Um, so this is the one uh, part of the uh, recommendation. The other one, of course, is related to uh, the coal uh, generation. And here, um, the, uh, the Commission, uh, they propose to phase out coal um, by 2038 at the latest, uh, if possible, already 2035. So that means um, a rapid reduction early on uh, in power generation from coal, and then um, a final uh, phase out of coal in the mid of the 2030s. Okay, um, so um, if you if you uh, think about um, uh, these recommendations, um, I think it's helpful to look at let's say the the modeling exercises the, that we have on the table um, on the development of the German electricity sector in the 2030s. And what you can see is that um, due to increases in uh, carbon prices, uh, due to um, uh, reduction. Uh, in capacities uh, because power plants reaching their technical lifetimes, no, um, um, there is uh, already a substantial uh, phase out uh, of coal power plants foreseen in the next decade or so. Uh, these are here studies um, from different modeling exercises, but they all show that uh, power generation from coal in the German, in, in the German uh, uh, electricity sector would almost be halved over the next decade. And that is all uh, driven by market forces. No, there is no uh, regulatory uh, uh, interaction uh, involved in this massive reduction of coal generation and capacities over the next decade. That's mainly driven by policies that are already enacted, like the uh, emissions trading system, um, together with overcapacities on the European market no, and the uh, age structure of the German uh, power plants. Uh, um, so if you keep that in mind, you might not be probably uh, too um, surprised um, uh, to see the next picture, uh, which is on uh, showing you on the uh, left-hand side in uh, brown the phase-out proposal of the, um, uh, the uh, commission. Uh, and in blue, I, I printed um, uh, a very simple reference, uh, which is uh, 45 years lifetime, which is the historic lifetime of power plants in Germany. Uh, we know that for the future, of course, this will not be no longer longer the reference, so power plants will run shorter, uh, so you should probably move this blue line a little bit more to the left, and what you can see is, well, indeed, the phase-out proposal of the uh, German, of this uh, commission, is more or less uh, just bringing uh, the coal phase-out a few years up front, uh, probably five years uh, from what you would have expected, no, uh, uh, with these market forces, and you can as well see there is a, one problem left, which are the relatively new coal power plants that have just been built uh, in recent years and are just going to be operational uh, for a long time and they are as well not going to be phased out um, uh, with the policy instruments that we have at hand uh, at the moment. Um, so. Um, so uh, then, of course, um, there was a, a lot of discussion how we should enact these pathways that I just showed you. And um, the uh, economists have argued that um, the negotiated phase-out is a bad idea 
no? because uh, uh, this is going to lead to inefficiencies from an economic perspective, and we should try to rely more on uh, a phase out that is market driven uh, by higher prices, uh, either in the ETS or by national prices, uh, like we know from the UK, the carbon floor price that is very effective in driving out coal power plants. Um, as I will show you, the German government has not followed this advice, but has actually um, started to negotiate bilaterally with lignite power plants uh, uh, on compensation schedules for closing the companies. Uh, and uh, they are going to set up now for the uh, hard coal power plants an auctioning system uh, where they are auctioning closure. Uh, of uh, hard coal power plants over the next 10 decades uh, to achieve the emission reduction. Um, there are many problems with these type of approaches, not only inefficiencies, as I will show you, um, but of course um, there is as well the problem that we have a lot of uh, new construction of gas-fired power plants, um, I will show you later, that's uh, going to be necessary, and of course the regulated uh, phase out is going to lead to uh, an improvement, no, not only of these gas power plants, no, but as well, uh, it's as well going to benefit the uh, the newer coal power plants. So you will have some type of coal uh, rebound, as we called it, no, uh, where the the newer coal power plants are picking up, no, uh, the generation capacities of the older plants that are phased out. Um, so in terms of carbon mitigation, uh, you should be quite skeptical, no, of what will be achieved, it's for sure much less than we see uh, from a technical perspective. Plus, of course, uh, we as well have to make sure that these reductions are going to be effective uh, in the system of the EU ETS because we are going to free up certificates um, that are going to be end uh, up uh, being used somewhere else. Um, this problem might be um, um, uh, mitigated a bit by the market stability reserve because the market stability reserve is going to uh, put away part of these emissions, uh, but in the longer run it's totally unclear you know, uh, what are the real effective reductions uh, going along uh, with this. So, um, so there are a lot of uh, arguments why you should work with a minimum price of carbon you know, in order to achieve the coal phase out uh, and uh, think about a minimum price of carbon in the ETS or national price uh, for CO2 and um, uh, my argument would be that um, as we are going to see an adjustment as well of the ETS, uh, it could be that uh, the whole coal phase out in Germany would have been implemented anyways uh, with stricter targets in the EU ETS. No? And then um, I will show you we are probably even worsening the system than uh, improving it. Okay, so uh, I'm going to, to jump this slide um, um, and I'm just going to tell you that um, uh, coal phase out is not going to add a lot on, uh, on electricity prices. So the electricity price signal on coal phase out will be relatively small, uh, but electricity prices in the German system are going to increase substantially, but for other reasons. Uh, and the reasons being uh, carbon uh, uh, CO2, um, oops, this one, uh, CO2, um, uh, prices increasing, uh, natural gas prices increasing, capacity being reduced, uh, nuclear phase out in Germany. So there are many reasons why electricity prices are going to increase, uh, people think, by 50% and, and more over the next decade. Um, but the coal phase out is going to be relatively small no, uh, compared to these big effects. Um, and there is a big dis or there was a big discussion about the security of supply, which is going to continue. Um, as we are facing out more and more coal because all studies show that uh, we need uh, for uh, uh, for um, the uh, potentially uh, for the potential problem of what we call Dunkelflaute, the dark lull, we need a lot of new investments in gas power plants um, in order to uh, uh, make here. Um, a secured electricity available in the German market. And there is at the moment not really an idea what are the investment conditions uh, for these new gas power plants uh, because of the actual situation where flexibility in the German market is practically not priced. Okay, so um, therefore we are going to monitor as well the coal phase out. Uh, in the next uh, years to come to see whether we are running into 
um, security of supply problems uh, in the German market. Okay, so um, so what is the outcome? Um, so what what was the decision? Actually, this was uh, the decision was from from last week. So this is uh, pretty new, um, and I'm going to uh, uh, show you here um, a slide and a comment uh, from a member of the Coal Exit Commission, uh, Felix Mattes, who was I think as well uh, in one of the seminars here, uh, and um, uh, he was uh, frustrated with the implementation and I share his frustration to some uh, extent uh, because he said it's insufficient from climate perspective. Why? Because uh, in the actual implementation of the plans, the German government has postponed the um, uh, phase out of individual power plants to the last possible date. And in the end, we know that it's about the cumulative emissions, no, uh, not the actual emission at a certain point. Um, so that is a problem. Um, he as well uh, states it's unwise from an energy system perspective. Yes, because the negotiated phase out was mainly with the ligni lignite power producers, which are the uh, actually the most um, damaging from an environmental point of view. And they had much better bargaining power with the German uh, government uh, because as well of these employment reasons. So the lignite power plants, they actually ended up being phased out le uh, at least, uh, least, uh, least here. So you see the brown ones now that are much postponed to the past, uh, while the black one is the hard coal, which was taken, which will have to be uh, reduced much earlier. And that, of course, doesn't make sense as well if you think about uh, the uh, economic perspective on reducing emissions in the German system. Um, um, uh, third, it's not going to be robust regarding state aid. Um, the, the companies have been given uh, huge amounts of money. Uh, uh, more than 600 million euro per gigawatt uh, for the lignite power plants. For plants I showed you uh, are actually um, uh, net present value negative. No, uh, I showed you the slide. No, so uh, giving so much money to these companies will be uh, scrutinized for sure. Um, and fourth, um, um, this consensus process I was talking about um, is uh, seen to be uh, disavowed uh, by the German government. Actually, there was. Uh, 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 just last week a press conference by eight members of this coal phase-out committee uh, uh, complaining you know, about uh, the implementation process and it as well was uh, now framed as an east-west um, uh, clash uh, because all the power plants that are phased out uh, late are actually East German power plants. So a lot of this regional uh, uh, thinking entered again uh, the discussion. So impl so idea was good, no, but implementation was very bad, no. Um, and uh, we see that um, we are going to face a lot of discussion about the policy as these power plants are going to uh, leave the system over the next uh, one and a half decades. Um, so that was the, the one exercise. The other exercise I want to briefly touch um, is the uh, the carbon pricing on in the non-ETS sector. So um, after the uh, the coal issue, uh, the uh, the German government started uh, to think about what should we do uh, in order to reduce emissions outside the ETS. Okay, my argument was they should not have touched the ETS sectors anyways, no, um, but they did, no, um, and um, as you have seen uh, in an unfavorable way potentially because um, uh, giving a high, a high compensations to these power plants very late in the process is of course as well generating an opportunity cost for the producers to phase out early. Uh, so it, you might even weaken the carbon price signal, no? Uh, because they know they should hang on because they are getting all this compensation if they are reducing very late in the process. So it's, it's, it, it would have been much better uh, to wait for the Green New Deal to emerge no, uh, and do that. Uh, but uh, that is the state of play here. Uh, in the non-ETS sector, there was an interesting development, uh, which I think um, can be as well interesting for many other countries, which is the introduction of carbon pricing in these sectors. Um, for a long time, the sectors outside the 
the ETS have been governed by other policy packages uh, in the transport sector, mainly uh, the uh, standards uh, uh, for the car or the uh, the car fleet regulation uh, in in Germany, uh, the uh, efficiency standards for buildings. No, that's all European legislation that was mainly uh, driving the development as well in the German market. Um, uh, now we are going to see, um, I th I think, uh, a substantial change. Uh, we are going to see more carbon pricing, and I'm going to show you the, the proposal, um, and that is going to influence as well the way we are debating the non-ETS sectors in Europe for sure, because the, 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 we know about the new commission, and as well they are going to look closely to the German model uh, of uh, pricing emissions outside the uh, industry. I, I wrote several um, comments on that, and I was relatively positive about the package that was not shared by all economists um, in, in Germany, but uh, compared to what we have before, uh, I think, as I said, it's really a, a big step forward, even though I'm, I'm going to complain as well a bit about the real implementation of these measures. So um, we had a lot of discussion, which is familiar to all, you all, if you're economists, about whether we should use taxes or an emissions trading system, and there are always pros and cons for using taxes versus emission trading. Um, uh, with a taxes, uh, you have a certainty about the costs, but you're uncertain no, about the emission reductions that are delivered by a specific tax. Uh, with, a, uh, with an emissions trading system, you know about the environmental effectiveness, but it's not clear what is the resulting price uh, in the emissions trading system. And so so the question is, uh, what do you favor uh, if you're setting up these policy instruments? And I was, uh, actually I was asking uh, for um, a, a CO2 tax in the short run uh, and in the long run an integration of the sectors in the EU emissions trading system. Uh, but politically a tax was not uh, sellable to the German government because they, if it's labeled tax, they are not going to agree to it. Then we made, um, we made a proposal um, uh, uh, that, uh, that was actually um, 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 uh, saying that we are looking for a fixed price emission trading system or fixed price certificate system. Um, so in order to, um, to help them overcome, oh, we have to go back uh, two slides, I think, uh, to help them to overcome uh, the the problems they have with the taxes, no, um, and um, they picked this up. Um, and what we are going to have in the German uh, case is we are going to have uh, a fixed price system um, for some time that is then evolving into an emissions trading system later on. Um, I think. The first part is good. Uh, the, the problem is, um, as I will show you, it's, it's going to end up in a national emissions trading system, which is bad, I think, no? because it's going to uh, make a lot of decisions in this emissions trading system, which will, make, will, which will make it very difficult to upscale it to the European level. Okay, so we might end up uh, as well here with some path dependencies, which which actually made it make make the whole situation worse. But anyway, so when thinking about the 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 the, uh, the level of the uh, prices that are required to achieve the targets, um, there was a lot of discussion about um, uh, the emission reduction possibilities, uh, capabilities of these sectors. And uh, I show you here um, uh, one slide from, the, uh, from this evaluation, um, taking into account different um, um, estimations of elasticities in the non-ETS sector. And the bottom line is, well, non-ETS sectors are really difficult to decarbonize, so the, um, uh, the prices that you have to uh, uh, hit now are very high in order to achieve the target. So in this um, example here, um, uh, we need uh, to reduce our uh, emissions by a hundred, more than 100 million tons, and um, the uh, expectations are prices are somewhere between 70 euro uh, and 350 euro, depending on the different numbers that are on the table. And uh, the, uh, the uh, median estimate is more like 130 euro per ton of carbon in the sectors compared to 
25 in the ETS, you know, or probably 45 uh, in 2030. Um, so um, that's, of course, already an indication that the, um, the reduction schedule I showed you with a different sector is economically problematic, you know, because it's putting uh, a lot of pressure on sectors that are difficult to decarbonize. At least they are difficult to decarbonize by pricing only. You know, and uh, therefore, um, uh, we ask uh, government not only to use prices, but as well uh, use other uh, instruments to bring down mitigation costs in the sectors such that the prices can actually work you know, on lower levels, which means uh, investment in public transport infrastructure, for example, and all these type of things that will help you know, making um, um, uh, switches you know, in behavior easier and thereby reducing the necessary prices uh, to achieve your targets. Um, so. So this is the situation um, uh, in terms of the um, necessary costs, and this is the implementation in Germany. Um, so we are going to start with a carbon price of 25 euro in uh, 2021, and this is going to increase to 55 euro uh, in the year 2025. And then there will be a corridor, because I told you they want to move then uh, to an emissions trading system for the non-ETS sector, so for heat and transport. Um, so so uh, for all the emissions that are not covered by the ETS, no, um, um, that uh, will have um, um, uh, ceilings and floor prices uh, in the non-ETS part. Okay. So for now, I mean, they have only specified 2026 between 55 and, and 65. But what I just told you, of course, indicates you know, that these prices you know, uh, are likely to be higher. You know, or they're always going to hit the ceiling. Uh, in, in which uh, case the, the tax would be better anyways. No? So that was the argument. Um, so um, uh, I think that's a very interesting development um, because that is showing the dedication of the German government to pricing uh, emissions outside the ETS. Uh, and this is going to be, of course, as well, a role model um, for further developments of the EU emissions trading system. Um, we have asked for a long uh, time uh, for an extension of the EU emissions trading system to other sectors. Uh, and this is going to be, I think, uh, um, an, an, a first um, uh, implementation of this idea in a very big economy in Europe. Um, so uh, naturally, you would think that the next step is to link somehow this national system uh, with the EU ETS um, and, um, uh, and then, then we will see that many of the other uh, member states are potentially following. At the moment, if you look at the um, the uh, climate um, uh, directive, no, uh, um, then um, for the non-ETS sectors, uh, then you can see that um, uh, there, there, are, uh, there, there is already some type of emissions trading implemented, so you can trade uh, uh, emission reductions um, uh, in the directive between uh, non ETS sectors in the member states, uh, but it is not formalized in terms of an emission trading system. Um, you can think that this system can evolve either as a non-ETS uh, emissions trading system covering all member states uh, with some type of interface uh, to the ETS sector or a full integration of the uh, system in the ETS. Uh, in, in, in any case, it, will, it means that we are going to see much more flexibility in achieving the national targets, and that's relevant uh, for the um, NECPs, so the National Energy and Climate Plans of the member states, uh, because they will have to factor in this higher degree of flexibility in the future. No? So uh, the NECPs, they will rely from my perspective at least, uh, on a more flexible system, taking into account um, emission reductions that are uh, achieved in other member states, in the non-ETS sectors or in the ETS. Okay, um, so this is uh, something that is, of course, fully not reflected in today's discussions, uh, but that, that will have to be reflected uh, in the future to come. Okay, so, um, so with this two... Um, Examples. I would like to to close the 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 presentation um, with uh, just a very brief um, uh, with with just a, a, a very brief um, summary. So um, I think the the coal phase out um, uh, was 
in principle a good idea because coal is a relatively cheap uh, option uh, to reduce emissions. But the political implementation turns out to be extremely costly. I talked about the structural change payments. I talked about the compensatory uh, payments for the uh, companies. Uh, we are now discussing as well, um, uh, we are also discussing uh, uh, regulation for sheltering industry from increased electricity prices, um, which I think will be as well very problematic, taking into account that electricity prices are going to increase anyways independent of the coal phase out and uh, we are going to see a lot of um, uh, lobbying as well around the uh, these type of compensatory measures um, so this will all be very expensive um, uh, in the ETS that would have been much cheaper there are uh, already uh, rules no for uh, indirect emissions no for uh, uh, competitiveness impacts of firms that's all in um, here we have to develop that on our own and that will be very costly um, uh, the uh, commission approach seems to be uh, good no, in getting this going, but obviously um, the results are not fully convincing and I think it's not as well transferable to other regions because the costs that are associated with this approach are simply too high. The problem is the taxpayer was not sitting on, these, uh, on the table of the coal commission. Okay, so they agreed uh, on many things, uh, knowing that in the end somebody else has to pay for it, and that could not be uh, that could not be an an example for anybody. No, uh, we in Germany probably can pay for it, but but it's it's not it's not not really transferable. And the third thing is, um, well, we really have to think about how we make sure that our reductions are effective. Um, uh, because this is not secured at the moment. And it's as well not trivial because there are many uh, difficulties in as well calculating what's the right level no, um, uh, of um, uh, reducing emissions certificates uh, to achieve effectiveness of uh, the emission reduction. Um, so this all has to um, well be uh, thought through. Uh, with the carbon pricing, I, I'm, I'm a little bit more uh, enthusiastic uh, because it introduced is now really, from my point of view, substantial carbon price in Germany. You have seen the schedule, uh, 55, 65 euro, that's a lot, okay? Um, and uh, you can calculate, uh, of course, what that means. Um, uh, that means, uh, for example, uh, for our, um, uh, for diesel and gasoline, now that means around 20 cents uh, increases in gasoline prices uh, over uh, a period of five years. So this is, uh, I think, a lot. No, um, and and we will see how this is going to play out in the in the long run. Um, I always I also talked a bit about the long term perspective and the path dependencies because you're again um, uh, fixing a system that is very domestic in small scale and it would have been better to work more uh, on the European implementation and I think there is still some room for that and we should push for it to find really European solutions for these things and not national solutions uh, because they are uh, going to be um, inefficient but in any case it's going to uh, push for more price-based policies on the European scale as well. Uh, with this example in mind. And we'll see that the uh, Green New Deal, of course, um, is going to pick up a lot of these things. Um, we are going to see higher carbon prices as an implementation of the Green New Deal proceeds. Um, then we, have, we, are, we are going to talk more about border carbon adjustment and these type of things uh, in the future to come. Um, but in the German case, we are now refocusing at the moment on renewable policies because we were now dealing a lot with, you know, with coal, carbon pricing, but we see that we are not achieving our renewable targets in the long term as well. Uh, mainly because of uh, fierce resistance uh, uh, on the ground uh, in Germany against uh, uh, mainly new windmills. Okay, uh, so uh, green deployment of windmills in Germany stopped last year, basically. No, uh, 1,000 uh, megawatts uh, of green uh, of new windmills uh, in Germany. Uh, so this is practically stopping. No, in the south in Bavaria, two windmills last year. Um, so a uh, lot of resistance on the ground, which explains, of course, that we are moving in Germany more to offshore. No, which as well explains why we have to think better about energy efficiency because we are not going 
going to get the uh, quantities of renewable electricity uh, that we have foreseen in our transformation packages, um, especially if we take into account, and that's my last point, that um, we put a lot of hope on sector coupling. Um, so the, the German, um, uh, if you look at the German uh, transformation, you see sector coupling with electricity plays a crucial role. Um, we want to move to electric vehicles. We want to move to heat pumps. No, um, so uh, that means we will need a lot of electricity, even with better efficiency. Uh, very likely, no, our electricity demand is going to increase as well um, uh, in the next years, which means um, we will need a lot of renewables. And if we don't get them, which I think is probably going to be the case, uh, then we have to think about other options. And the other options is uh, importing uh, either electricity, but more likely uh, importing um, synthetic fuels in one way or the other uh, to the German energy market. That's green, green gas no? uh, that's uh, going to be then uh, produced somewhere else. Uh, yesterday evening, uh, I talked about the new hydrogen strategy of the German government. There you see that a lot of the the green uh, hydrogen uh, should come from North Africa, which then has to be transported somehow uh, to Germany. Uh, and they even mention the Mediterranean gas pipelines again. Um, so we are going to see a, a reshuffling here as well uh, and a bigger role uh, of, uh, uh, on infrastructure bringing hydrogen uh, to the system uh, and a bigger role on um, strategic import activities no, uh, of synthetic fuels in the long run. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>